In our first talk, we spoke about Buddhist art. In the second talk, we discussed the way of entering into Buddhist art. Today, we will speak about training the mind in order to have and use Buddhist art. It's an art to train successfully, and then it's to use that beneficially is an even greater art. So there is art in both the training to train successfully, and the highest art is in, then in using it beneficially in everyday, ordinary life. We can say, put this briefly by saying it's the art of using our breathing advantageously in all the responsibilities and work of our everyday life to, to train so that we can use the breathing beneficially in all the responsibilities and activities of ordinary life. We can look at this in two, from two perspectives or in two aspects. That of being a body of knowledge and understanding, a body of human knowledge. Or we can look at it as being culture, a culture which comes down to us from very ancient times. We can say this because when we look through the history of this, of using the breath, of meditating with the breath, we see references to very ancient times. Even in the earliest times when humanity was first making progress in culture or its, in its development, our primitive ancestors living in the forests and caves were able to use, make use of the breathing on a certain level, on the level appropriate to their, that stage of development. Part of this knowledge of the breathing is rather instinctual, that it's quite easy for the human being to know that certain kinds of breathing give us strength and energy, which can come in very handy in the struggle of life. And so, based on that, human beings have have struggled to gain some mastery over the breathing and use it to their benefit. And then the times came when certain men would go off into the forests, into the wilds, to as hermits and ascetics and such things. And these men would, would meditate and explore quite deeply the possibilities of the breathing until they understood it more and more deeply, until it became a certain science, a particular branch of knowledge of humanity. This knowledge and understanding of the breathing then developed further until reaching its highest point or stage in the Buddha's time. But this isn't to say that it was only the Buddhists who understood this. This knowledge and practice with the breathing was, was very widespread 
all the different um, religious groups and spiritual seekers were had knowledge of this. It was widespread and widely put into practice. It wasn't just limited to the Buddhists. Now, when it was in general usage, the common or neutral term for this body of knowledge was pranayama, to control the breathing or mastery of the breathing. And this this was being used for training the mind for certain religious or mental benefits. This knowledge developed to its highest point in in Buddhism and has since then come to be known or in this one particular form has come to be known as Anapanasati Bhavana um, development of the mind through mindfulness with breathing in and out. This was the these various practices and with the breathing were then put in their highest form, the most scientific and systematic approach. And then since then there has been no no one has been able to come up with a better a better usage of the breathing. So we say that the highest development of this breath science, breathing science, came in the Buddha's time. Now please understand that this is a science, but it's a science of the mind. Nowadays when we think of science, we almost always think of material science, physical science to the point that we think science is merely about material things. One should be aware that science, there's also a science of the mind, such as this mindfulness with breathing science. But it's not just of the mind because life also includes the body. So there must be some proper understanding of the body as well. So this is the kind of science we're talking about. Please understand that mindfulness with breathing is a kind of science. It has the the methods and the systematicness of a science. When we speak of science, we generally mean something that will bring us certain material benefits. When we think of science, we think of something that's going to uncover material benefits for us. But when we speak of art, we speak of something that has to do with beauty, which has to do with balance and harmony, with, with great subtlety refinement and skill. So art is something higher, more refined, more beautiful than science. And so we we speak of mindfulness with breathing then as an art. Science aims at material benefits, but art aims at beauty, at subtlety at refinement. And this is what mindfulness with breathing is about. It's an art of living in this world in the way that brings the best results. However, it's possible to use both the art and the science together we can bring them together in ourselves, in our, our way of living, so that we, both, we have both the science and an art, and the art. We can have these 
in the way we live our lives, both science and art. We can have a life which is anapanasati, a life which is mindfulness with breathing all the time. In this way, our life will become both a science and an art. It's possible to have a life which is governed and protected by mindfulness with breathing all the time. We need to train ourselves to this level. <clears throat> Our lives are filled with thinking, speaking, and acting. These, we use these three words as a basic um, way of explaining and examining what we do in life. We think, we speak, and we act. We need to speak, act, <coughs> think, speak, and act, and deal with our thinking, speaking, and acting by having mindfulness all the time. Our way of dealing with these basic activities of life is to be mindful, and we can do this through mindfulness with breathing. Now, one can have anapanasati all the time when one's thoughts, <coughs> speech, and actions are with are always done with mindfulness of breathing in and out. If all of our thoughts, speech, and actions are done with this mindfulness of breathing, if one is well-practiced, well-versed, expert in this, then our lives will be lived through this mindfulness with breathing. Now, to if one isn't extremely well-practiced in mindfulness with breathing, then it won't be possible to have it with one all the time. So it's necessary to to, const, to keep practicing, to practice, to review, to, to train in this over and over again until one reaches the level of expertise where one has this mindfulness with breathing or one lives through, with and through, mindfulness with breathing. This is something that you won't be able to do in just 10 days. It's something that we all must continue working on, continue developing until we reach the necessary level of expertise. Next we'll speak about the way of training and developing this understanding and skill. We'll talk about the, the techniques of doing so. You can think of this as being a kind of technology but it's not the ordinary materialistic kind of technology that we are most familiar with. It's a technology of the mind, and we can develop and make the most of this mental technology. This is what we'll be speaking about henceforth. The overall practice of mindfulness with breathing is broken up into four areas or four basic subjects of life. The first is the breathing. The second are the feelings, the vedana, 
The third is the mind, the jitta itself. And fourth are all the things which surround life, or dhamma. <clears throat> These are the four fundamental subjects of our practice and, in, and investigation of life. The gaya, or body, the vedana, feelings, the jitta, mind, heart, and dhamma. We should understand these four words correctly in order that we will ensure a proper study and practice. In the first area of, of practice, <clears throat> we train with the breathing. We work with the breathing until we can use the breathing to master the body. Although we train with the breathing, we develop mastery over the body so that this body is very strong and is perfectly active. We can get the best kind of body for our purposes through training with the breathing. <clears throat> In the secondary uh, of practice, we train with the feelings. We train and study with the feelings until we become masters over them. Being masters of the feelings means that they don't get out of control and they have no ability to cause problems for us. So we, we work with the feelings until we can master them. Especially to have mastery over the feeling of excitement. When excitement is out of control, when it's in charge, we become very stupid. But when we can master this feeling of excitement, then it, it won't have the ability to make us foolish. So this second area is to gain mastery over the feelings, especially feelings of excitement. If we can't control excitement, then the result will be mindlessness. When we get excited, we lack mindfulness. And when there isn't mindfulness, then we fall too much under the power of positive and the positive and the negative. And then we, then our mind gets into very foolish circumstances, what we call the defilements of greed, anger, and delusion. And then this leads us into all the different kinds of problems that we meet in life. This is what brings on dukkha. This is an example of how important it is to master the feelings. If we don't master the feelings, then it's impossible to be truly mindful and then we fall too much under the power of positive and negative. So in the second area of study, we, we practice with the feelings until we understand them and gain mastery, until we become masters of the feelings. In the next area of our practice, we work with the mind directly. When the mind is correct, then everything is correct. And when the mind is wrong, then everything, <coughs> then everything goes wrong. So now we study and practice with the mind until we have mastery over it. When there is this 
or we can say the mind has self-mastery. When there's this mastery over the mind, then the mind can be kept always right. The mind will always be proper and fitting as it needs and should be. This is how we become masters of the mind. The fourth area is to study and train with all the things that surround us, which here is called Dhamma. This means all the things that surround us, these are all the things which can be the basis of attachment, all the things which are ready to deceive us and trick us into attaching to them. These here are all called Dhamma. Now, Dhamma, the way it's used in this case, isn't the Dhamma which is the correct practice, the doing of our duty that allows us to live in the world without dukkha. This is another meaning, the meaning of Dhamma that means everything. All the things, all the natures which surround us and which we attach to. In this area now we, we train and study all of these things. We practice with them until they have no ability to trick us into attachment. Then the mind is above all these things. The mind has mastery over all these things which surround us to the point where they can no longer trick us. We can summarize all this by saying one becomes master one gains mastery over all these things. One gains mastery over the body. One gains mastery over the feelings. One gains mastery over the mind itself. And finally, one gains mastery over all the things that surround us. In short, one is becomes master of everything. One has mastery over all things. And therefore there is nothing which can become a problem for us. There isn't anything which can cause problems or difficulties for us when there is this mastery. We won't be enslaved by anything. Nothing can enslave us into problems, into dukkha. Another meaning of this mastery, an implication of it, is being victorious. One of the names of the Buddha is the, the victorious one. The victorious one. Which means the Buddha was victorious over all the, all the low and harmful, deceitful things, which are called Mara, all the, all the temptations in life. The Buddha was victorious over them and mindfulness with breathing was his, his means to victory. And so to, to be master to gain this mastery is to be victorious over all these things so that none of them can trick us or deceive us into anything low, har harmful, or dangerous. Now, many of you have heard of the Buddhist explanation of the word Buddha, the one who knows, who is awake, who has blossomed fully. You can see probably then that this could not happen without being victorious. One knows and then wakes up and then from waking up there is this blossoming <clears throat> to bloom, 
to blossom fully with life, in life. How could that happen without victory? Without victory, what could blossom? How could there be any blossoming? And so, in the word, the one of the essences of the word Buddha is this victory, this quality of being victorious. The question now is whether you understand the meaning of victory and defeat. We're worried that you don't understand what victory is and then you, by default, are quite satisfied and content with defeat. If we don't know what victory is, then we will settle for defeat and even think we're quite well off in our status as slaves in servitude. Defeat means to surrender to, to, to be satisfied with, to be content with all the kinds of sensual pleasures, with all the sexual pleasures. When we take satisfaction in such things, this is to surrender to them or to be defeated by them. When we do so, then the mind is under the power of positive and negative. To be victorious is to not just let the mind go being satisfied with and content with all these, with all these things. To not let the mind just fall for all the positive and negative things which surround us but to be above these things. This is what victory means. And so we must understand, understand what is meant if we're going to have a choice between victory and defeat. Otherwise, we just settle for defeat. Laughing at the <coughs> positive, crying at the negative under the mercy of these positive-negative things in servitude, in slavery. We live in a world that is full of industry, that worships industry and technology, that produces all kinds of things that are designed to defeat us. Our modern world is full of positive and negative things. Our economies are dedicated to producing positive things in order to defeat us. When we live in a world like this, a world of just full up, crammed full of positive things which are meant to attract us, deceive us, and defeat us to the point where we're always being bounced around, sometimes with greed, sometimes with anger, sometimes fear, other times excitement. This is the, this is the way the world is, this is the way people seem to want the world to work. If this is the world that we live in, the world that we must live in, if we have no choice, then we need some means to be victorious, to raise ourselves above all that flotsam, all that chaos and strife, to be above the, this, this obsessive worship of the positive, which we find in our modern, our so-called modern world. We need some form to be victorious over the, the four areas of life, the body, the feelings, the mind, and Dhamma. Mindfulness with breathing is our means to victory. Now we'll talk about the 
way of practicing anapanasati, mindfulness with breathing. The first thing we must do is prepare ourselves. In order to practice, we must be ready. So we prepare our, our bodies, our living situation, our food, our clothing, our lifestyle, and so on. We prepare ourselves so things are, are orderly, so things are balanced and peaceful. We, we refrain from doing things which will interfere with our practice. We don't go wandering, wandering the streets at night. We put aside addictive substances. We, we seize sexual relations and so on. All the things which, which make our minds chaotic and restless, we put aside. We prepare our physical situations and our lifestyle. We live in a proper, with proper discipline and restraint in order to prepare ourselves for practice. For example, when you come here, you stay over at the meditation center, which has been set up for just these purposes, to provide sufficient, sufficient conditions for practice. So while you're here, please make proper use of the facilities and stay within the, the discipline that is asked of you. This will enable you to be, to prepare yourself to be physically and mentally ready to practice mindfulness with breathing. Discipline is very important and necessary for our practice. To have disciplinary rules and regulations are necessary. So please um, understand these, understand their necessity, and follow them wholeheartedly so that you are ready and able to practice correctly. The next thing we need to prepare are our bodies, to prepare our noses with which we breathe and to prepare our breathing so that all these things are in order. To have a proper nose, to have a clean nose is very, very useful to make our breathing easy and free. The next thing we need to have is a suitable place. We need to find a place that is relatively free of disturbances. You won't find a place that is perfectly free of disturbances. One shouldn't be so attached to perfect condition. One merely need find a place that's quiet and peaceful enough. Then the next thing to prepare is our posture. For practice, we need a suitable posture, especially one that is stable. We need a secure, firm posture, one that won't fall over, one that will support us as we practice. Now there are postures which are too tense, which are too forced, and then there are those which are too loose. One needs to find a appropriate posture. One shouldn't force it too much or be too loose, too easy going. Traditionally the posture that is recommended is the lotus posture, although for some of us it's not yet proper. Some of us can't yet sit that way comfortably. 
but we should give attention to developing a proper posture, one that is very secure and stable, one that is convenient physically and mentally. As we develop this proper posture, then it makes our practice easier, things go more smoothly with less difficulties. The Chinese have the same difficulty as the Europeans. They've grown up sitting on chairs, and so it's, they find it difficult to sit on the floor. So the Chinese have tried to um, deal with this by meditating on chairs. However, the results have not been very good. And so the serious meditators then learn to sit in what they call the Indian style. The, the Chinese refer to the meditation posture as the Indian style or Indian posture. This is something that once you try it, you'll see how firm and stable it is. Instead of wobbling on a chair, one sits firmly with one legs, one's legs folded in front of one, and then you can put your hands on your knees. If you do this, you'll see that it's very stable. It's impossible to fall over. If you sit in the right posture, even if the mind becomes semi or, or unconscious, sub, or the mind goes into the subconscious, you still won't fall over because this posture is so naturally stable. This is the posture that's recommended for ease and convenience in practice. We'd like to take a little time to examine some fine points of, of posture. We once saw a picture in the National Geographic magazine of someone sitting in the diamond posture. We'd like to speak most of all about the diamond posture in which each foot is on the opposite thigh, and then one's hands can be on the knees in front. There's a picture of a carving in rock, which is at least, which is four to five thousand years old, of this. The original is probably in a museum somewhere. We think that this may have originally originated in Egypt and then came to India. But the Indians have known how to sit in this way for, for 4,000 or more years. It's a very ancient and important posture. Now, some people feel that this is too strained, and so they prefer to sit on chairs. But to sit in a chair is a little bit too loose, a bit too sloppy. It's, it's important to develop a posture which is more convenient and reliable. So we'd like you to now take a close look at the diamond posture. Please, please watch me. Traditionally, the diamond posture is considered the ideal posture. It's the most stable, the most balanced, and so on. But some people find it too strained or too difficult. We'd like to advise another posture which is neither sloppy nor strained. Instead of sitting with each foot on the opposite thigh as in the diamond posture, you can watch as we do this. You can put one foot on the other on the on the other thigh and then the other foot under the knee. 
then instead of trying to make yourself sit up perfectly straight you can take each hand and hold it on your cheeks just cradle your face in your hands in a comfortable way and then you can bend down and put each elbow you put one elbow on the in the instep of your foot and you can put the other elbow on your knee if your left foot is on your left thigh like i'm sitting then your left elbow goes in the instep of that foot and then the right elbow on the knee in this posture if you try it you can it's possible to relax completely one can be very relaxed and still one is completely stable it's a very firm posture in the diamond posture you can't fall over and that's true of this one because you've got your arms to prop you up you can't fall over it's very comfortable if you want you can even sleep quite comfortably in this this posture now this way of sitting is not in the classical texts it's not an officially sanctioned meditation posture and so some people will call me a heretic for advising it but nonetheless it's a middle way it's neither sloppy nor loose it's you can sit this way and you can focus on your breathing in any way you need to this way of sitting doesn't interfere with the breathing it's still possible to breathe freely and to be mindful of the breathing so this way of sitting has all the necessary ingredients of firmness stability one is able to relax and one and it doesn't interfere with the breathing so if you prefer the diamond posture you're free to sit like that but if you'd like you can try this this other way of sitting there's one secret we we left out but it's it's crucial one must maintain a straight back or specifically the spine must be straight so whatever way one sits one must keep the spine straight and if you want to sit in this new way that we've advised first sit with a straight spine and then as you bend down make sure you bend from the hips or from the lower back don't just droop the shoulders in a in a lazy way but bend from the hips so that one keeps the spine straight then if the spine is kept straight as you sit the lungs will hang freely and the breathing will will not won't be inter- interfered with so whatever way we sit to give the breathing the most freedom and comfort we must keep the spine straight so you have the freedom to choose whichever posture works best for you the one that is most comfortable most stable most relaxed which is neither too tense nor too loose you have the freedom to choose what works best for you <clears throat> now the next thing is to become mindful of the breathing to establish our awareness on the breathing we use the word be aware or of the breathing or pay attention to the breathing but the purpose here is to study 
to thoroughly investigate the breathing. And so it's not just to, one must understand the words pay attention in suffi with sufficient detail and depth. One doesn't just watch in a kind of lazy or, or glazed over way, but one mm -hmm. actually studies one investigates the breath, all the different possibilities of the breath and how they are. One carefully investigates all the different and all the things associated with the breathing. The Buddha used the word sikati. Sikati means to study, to train, to work with something thoroughly in order to understand it completely. So please understand the words awareness or pay attention to um, comprehensively as we've explained. So we study all the different kinds of breathing. We investigate the long breathing and the short breathing, the coarse breathing and the smooth subtle breathing one carefully pays attention to in order to investigate until one knows these different kinds of breathing inside out. Now here we, we study by actually feeling, by actually experiencing these things. One isn't just guessing and estimating by using thought, by figuring out the breathing but one watches it, one experiences it thoroughly. This is how we investigate the breathing until we come to the point where we know the nature of the breathing. Now the essence of this understanding is to observe, to take note of how the different kinds of breathing influence the body. Every kind of breathing has its particular effect upon our physical bodies. And so we must investigate this carefully to watch how each kind of breath affects, influences, changes the body until we realize more and more deeply through our own experience, not just by thinking, but through feeling this, we see how the, the breath and the body are inseparably interrelated. We see that whichever way the breath goes, the body follows in that way, until one sees quite clearly that one can, one can change, one can manage the body by using the breathing. This is, this is the, the thing we must learn from our own experience of breathing in and out. So in the end, we, we come to realize that there are, we can say, two bodies or two groups. The word, Pali word here is kaya, which can mean body or group. There's the flesh body and there's the breath body. And to see that these two are interrelated, that what we call our, our physical body has this flesh body and this breath body. And to see how closely related they are and how the, the breath body can control, can, can control the, the flesh body. In the Pali, the Buddha called this um, sapagayang bhatisangweti, which means thoroughly experiencing all bodies, which means these, this flesh body and the breath body, experiencing them together how they're interrelated 
and how the breath body influences the physical flesh body. Some of the English translations um, translate the word sapa incorrectly. The Buddha clearly used the word sapakayang, which means all bodies. But for some reason, some translators translate it as the whole body, although there's no grammatical basis for this translation. Sabha means all. It never means whole. So the meaning here is all bodies, which is the flesh body and the breath body together. And so experiencing this secret that it's not possible to adjust the flesh body directly. You can't just tell it to be relaxed and calm and peaceful. It doesn't work. But what one can adjust the flesh body on a very deep level using the breath body. As one <clears throat> understands this interrelationship more and more, this secret can be used to become the flesh body more and more. So this is the secret of the first tetrad, the first four lessons of mindfulness with breathing. So now we, we can summarize what we've been saying by saying one now has, one is master over the body. We have a body which is fresh, relaxed, healthy, peaceful. We have the, just the right body we need for further practice of meditation. This, this completes the first Petra. And an important word here is the word Gamaniya, which means active, that we have a body that's ready for further practice of meditation. It's the, the body that's fully prepared and ready to be used as we need to. Now we come to the study of the feelings. The feelings are things we can't help, they just happen. They happen and so we experience them. Now, as we've been practicing all along until gaining mastery over the body, then it just is natural that various strong feelings will occur. There'll be an excited sense of satisfaction, which we can call rapture. This occurs, this can occur in a very excited way so that the whole nervous system is shaking and bouncing, kind of hopping. So one, if that occurs, one, one, now these things will have happened off and on previously, but once we've gained mastery over the body, then we're able to study these feelings specifically. Now sometimes this satisfaction is very excited. Other times it's very calm, it's much more polite instead of this kind of disorderly shaking. It's, it's much calmer and cooler. But still there's kind of a bouncy, bubbling <laughs> excitement, which we can call contentment. <clears throat> Studying these various degrees and the difference between the very excited, almost out of control, excited rapture, as well as the more restrained, yet still excited satisfaction is the first aspect of investigating the feelings. When it's still very excited, when there's kind of a trembling all over, this is called rapture, or in Pali, it's called piti, piti. When this excited trembling of rapture is calmed and cooled down, when there's a a calm 
feeling of joy. That is called sukha, or we can translate it contentment. So understanding these two kinds of pleasant feelings, PT and sukha, must be is the first part of our study here. Now in ordinary life we see these happy feelings, this PT and sukha, as as fun, as wonderful, as something to get excited about, to throw a party and all that. But in the situation of practicing anapanasati, we see them as things which stimulate, which would stimulate the mind. We put aside our ordinary ideas and opinions about the feelings as of these happy feelings as being fun and desirable and the purpose of our lives. We put that attitude aside and study how these happy feelings excite and stimulate the mind. Being able to control these feelings means that we can control our thinking. If we have mas mastery over these feelings, then either we can control thoughts so that there's no thinking, or we can make sure that thought only goes in a way that is useful, which is of, of value and benefit. If we just let the feelings excite and stimulate the mind, thinking can go all over the place. But if we learn to control the feelings, if we can master them, then we can either stop the thinking or keep the thinking on a beneficial and healthy course. The brief formula here is we can control the mind by controlling the feelings. We can control the jitta by controlling the vetana. Next we come to the jitta, the mind or the, the heart. This is to master, master the mind. This is a very difficult practice. The way of practicing here is quite um, refined and hard to do. First, we experience all the different kinds of mind. We experience the mind in the, diff the many different forms it takes. Then we, we make the mind, we put the mind in certain states. We, we force the mind or we control the mind so that it's in certain ways. This is how we, this is the essence of training with the mind. So first we get to know all the different minds that we have experienced. All the different minds that we have experienced in life, we are likely to come back. And we, we experience the states, these various states of mind. Not only do we experience these states of mind, but we use them to get an understanding of the kind of mind we haven't yet experienced, the mind of the arahant, the being who is totally beyond greed, anger, and delusion. So for example, we, when there is lust in the mind, we experience that lustful mind and then we can also begin to kind of estimate or guesstimate what the mind is like when there is no lust. When there is anger, we experience that angry mind. And then we can also st imagine what the mind is like when there is no anger, the same way with delusion. So we, we experience the different states of mind that we're, we're used to. 
And then we also use this to get an understanding of the mind of the enlightened being. And all of this is for the purpose of understanding the mind. So we study the mind in these various different states. An example of how we do this is take, for instance, love. First one experiences how love bites the heart. One feels, one experiences that biting of love. And then when this love fades away, one experiences how the mind is, the heart is free of that biting. These one can experience directly. And then one also can get an understanding of what it would be like when love cannot arise ever again, when this, when this erotic or attached love can never happen again, how peaceful and, and joyful the mind will be. This is an example of, of all the different kinds of things that can arise in the mind to explore them in this way. In, under, in order to understand the mind thoroughly. Now once one has studied all these different manifestations of the mind, then one trains in mastering the mind. The first way to do this is to delight the mind, to delight the mind with Dhamma, to make the mind delighted, contented, satisfied with things that ought to delight it, which can delight it, make it happy in a safe way. So this is the first way of controlling or mastering the mind. Then second, we master it by concentrating it, by making the mind stable, clear, and active. And then after doing that, we gain mastery by liberating the mind, liberating the mind from all the things that it is attached to. These are three ways of mastering the mind. In short, one is master over the mind. Being master of the mind is something truly wonderful. It's an, a, a truly excellent ability. To be master over the mind is to have reached a very high stage of understanding and practice. So one should try to do this. One should put, give one's effort to this so that one can realize this excellent ability. When there is mastery of the mind, then the mind can be maintained in a state of, of stillness. The mind can be kept in a silence and peacefulness, in correctness, so that nothing can shake it or trouble it or manipulate it. So this is practicing for mastery of the mind. After, <coughs> after practicing citta nubhatsana, contemplation of the mind, until there is mastery of the mind, then we move on to Dhammanupatsana, contemplation of Dhamma. This is to gain mastery over all the things which surround us. Ordinarily, we look at the things around us as things to like and dislike. But now we see that these are things which deceive us and we practice until we have mastery over all these things so none of them can deceive us anymore. Now the thing here is to observe that everything is constantly flowing, that all things are ceaselessly changing. This is to see the fact of impermanence of things. So what one, to get from on, out from under the power of things, the first thing to do is to see their 
constant change and flow there, impermanence. Keep watching to see that the impermanent things are unreliable, undependable, that all these things are cannot be truly satisfying. They're imperfect and unsatisfying. And further, they, they just constantly change according to their causes and conditions. They're under the control of causes and conditions. There's no owner of them. There's no controller. These things are all not self. So one continues to observe these facts until seeing that they're, they're under the law of nature. They just follow the law of conditionality. That they're void of any self of any I or mine. They're just what they are. They're just as they are, changing, unreliable, undependable, um, unownable, void of self. Seeing the thusness of them, seeing the adamayada of them, the unconcoctableness of things. This is what we call the nine das, the nine eyes, or insights. This is the first step. But the, the crucial point, the starting point, is to, to experience the impermanence of things. If we don't see, if we don't realize impermanence in things, then we, we have no chance of, of going anywhere. One has to... It's the, starting point is experiencing impermanence, experiencing it within inner experiences, being more and more aware of the impermanence of inner experiences, and to see the impermanence of external things, to become aware of anicca the fact, the truth of impermanence, while breathing in and breathing out. So as we see, the more we see impermanence, the more it just continues to seeing all the other facts about things there, unsatisfactoriness, selflessness, voidness, thusness, and so on. And as, as this happens, we begin to feel a, a particular awareness or feeling, which is the fading away of things. The attachment we have to things begins to fade away. All these things in, in our lives and around us that we are attached to, now as we begin to see their impermanence, their selflessness, their voidness, that attachment begins to break up, to dissolve, to, to fade away. In short, what happens is we, we finally start to see that things don't listen to us. All these things that are, we've attached to, we think that they're going to listen to us and provide us with what we want. But now we realize that these things go their own way. They've got their own stories to, to play out. And so they go their own way and they don't listen to us. Seeing this, realizing this more deeply, our attachment to things fades away. We can experience, we can, we can feel this fading away of attachment more and more deeply. The first lesson of Dhamma is the fact of impermanence and then all the other facts that follow from it. The second lesson is that of the fading away of attachment, or viraka. As attachment fades away and fades away, it eventually ends. If anything just keeps on fading, it eventually comes to a point where it's gone, where it goes out. This is called nirota, which is the third lesson of Dhamma here. Experiencing that attachment has ended. Where there was once attachment, that attachment has faded away until now it's gone. 
it's ended, it's quenched. This cessation or ending of attachment is the third, third lesson here. The meaning of this is freedom. When attachment goes out, the mind is free. There is freedom. There is no positive or negative, there is nothing positive or negative anymore which can trick the mind. Nothing can trick it and enslave it. The mind is then liberated from the prison of attachment. The mind has, is saved from the prison of ego, the prison of self, which has been trapping the mind all along. Now the mind has escaped. It's free because attachment has, has ended, has quenched. Let us add one more lesson to complete the set. There's a, a rather strange word here which the Buddha used. It means to throw back, to, to re throw back to its owner. The word is bhati nitsaka, which is to toss back. Here, you can understand the meaning if we use a metaphor. It's up until now, we've been thieves. We've been, we've been stealing all kinds of things, saying, this is me, this is mine, claiming all kinds of things which actually belong to nature, to Dhamma. And so thus we are thieves. But now that attachment has ended, we realize we stop claiming these things to be I and mine. And so it's like we're tossing them back to their rightful owner, to nature, to Dhamma. So this is the final lesson, to toss everything back. Bhati Nitsaka, sometimes it's translated renunciation. But it's not just giving up, it's giving back. It's to fully acknowledge that these are all part of nature, that they're not, having seen that they're not I or mine. This is the, this is the completion. This is to complete our lives. To do this is to fulfill the purpose of our lives. Having done this, we've done everything that an individual life needs to do. After this, it's just all extra credit. But this is to complete the meaning and purpose of our lives, to be able to toss everything back to nature. So to summarize, we practice until we are mind masters of the body, masters of the feelings, masters of the mind, and master over all the things in life, all the things in nature which have deceived us and tricked us into falling for the positive and the negative. This is to accomplish everything in life that needs to be accomplished. This is this is to have realized, to achieve the most wonderful thing there is, to be master of everything so that nothing can defeat, defeat one ever again. So now you can understand the value and importance of anapanasati and have a framework in which to practice it. Now, you won't be able to accomplish everything we've described in 10 days. It's necessary that you take what you've started and continue to practice every day to keep developing this further and further so that more and more we have anapanasati as our partner in life, to have mindfulness with breathing as our partner so that more and more our lives are above all problems. So more and more our lives are free of the tyranny of positive and negative, less and less trapped in ego.
Last of all, we would like to take a look at how anapanasati brings us to the art or how it is art. First, it enables us to live with, to live with, to exist with things which are constantly changing without any of those things causing us any dukkha. Anapanasati enables us to live with things which are constantly changing without them being a problem. We can, further, we can live with things which cannot be attached to. There are all these things that we can't attach to. As soon as we try to attach, they bite. And so now we are able to live with them with all these things which are impossible to grasp at and cling. And finally, this art enables us to live in a world full of crazy people. Don't take this as being a crude statement, but the world is full of, of crazy people, people who are crazy with selfishness, obsessed with their own benefit, people who are full of attachment and spend their entire lives just seeking their own benefit, people who are obsessed with selfishness. The world is is full of crazy people. Anapanasati will, this art will enable us to live in this world with full of crazy people without them being of any danger to us. It's not some, there's nothing much we can do about it. There are going to be crazy people in this world no matter what we try to do. And According to the material progress in the world, there will be this craziness, this selfishness, and obsession with personal benefit. But will this highest art will enable us to live in a world of full of crazy people without being harmed by them. And finally, with this art, life won't bite its owner our lives will not bite their owners. Then we'll have realized the highest success in life, a life that is, instead of biting itself, a life that is blissful and useful, a life in which there is the highest happiness of true peace, and a life then which is freed in order to be useful. When life doesn't bite its owner, then there's this highest art of living peacefully, blissfully, usefully. Last of all, let us thank you, give very special thanks for your being very good listeners. Nonetheless, you've been very patient and stayed with us to the end. So we thank you for being good listeners and wish you the greatest success in your practice of mindfulness with breathing. May, although you may have come as tourists, may you leave as pilgrims. So thank you once again, and may you meet the greatest success in your practice. And that closes our final talk.